so whenever I talk about artificial intelligence or hear about artificial intelligence, I have a lot of questions, and maybe you do too. For example, one thing I'm wondering is often, when we talk about AI, what is actually a typical artificial intelligence? It's hard to see you, but could everybody who believes that the image in the red is a typical AI raise your arm, please? That's a few people, cool. And could everybody who believes that the image in blue is a typical AI raise your arm, please? That's also a few people. I, I believe it's a few less, a few, few people less. And maybe think for a moment, but based on the choice you did, what makes it typical for you? What, what constitutes a typical AI? And to, to zoom a bit out, who of you feels mostly excited about the prospect of artificial intelligence? Can you please raise your arms? That's quite a few people, that's cool. What excites you about the idea of artificial intelligence? And who of you feels mostly worried about AI? It's actually perfectly legit to feel both at the same time, so those of you who feel worried, can you please raise your arm? That's also quite a few people, that's cool. That means the topic is relevant, which I believe it, it is very much so. And what worries you about the prospect? So, and another question that I often ask, when we look at AI in media, in movies, or even in, even when I go to less technical conferences sometimes, there's a lot of speculation about AI. Can it become conscious? What, what if AI attacks us? The Terminator scenario, for example, but really, AI is usually, at least the AI we have right now, is not the, the image in red. It's not a Roma, the robot roaming the street and having their own will and maybe becoming conscious and maybe even claiming personhood, which is something I've been debating with people. But it's really just, this is, the blue thing is the image of my washing machine and it has a really small artificial intelligence component, a pr program that steers the, the spinning and the washing cycles. And that, to me, is, is much more typical of what we have, what we see as AI right now. We have AI in, in chatbots when we go to an e-commerce site and argue with, the, we, we're not directly led to the customer support, but we have to argue with the chatbot. We have AI in a lot of small situations, in cars, in phones, in social media, everywhere. And really, this, these small, kind of subtle programs are what, what it really is for artificial intelligence for us right now. But that leads me to more questions. Why are the expectations of what we see in movies, what we debate on TV, what we debate in conferences, so different from the AI that we actually have? Because we are, we are already surrounded by AI, whether we are aware of it or not. And how does technological change in the field actually work in the space of AI? And how can we make AI work for us and not the other way around? These are the questions I would like to explore with you today in my talk. But I would like to start with a story. And some of you might be familiar with this because you maybe have the same phone. But my, I have a smartphone and it has a facial recognition system. So the idea is, when I look at my phone, it will recognize me. And most of the time it does. And when somebody else looks at my phone, it will recognize that it's not me and not unlock the phone. So that, in theory that sounds very convenient. But then, as we've heard several times before, about 18 months ago a pandemic struck. And in public spaces, we all wanted to wear masks. And with a mask, the facial recognition wouldn't work anymore. And so then I was suddenly, when I was on the public transport and I wanted to look up the schedule, I was suddenly locked out of my phone. Quite annoying. And relatedly, coming back to the washing machine I already talked about, generally, this is a really cool program that I built into my washing machine. It saves water, it saves energy, and it uh, optimizes the, the washing cycle so it's uh, environmentally friendly and also that it costs less, presumably costs less money. But whenever I wash my bed sheets in it for some reason, it totally malfunctions. And when it, whenever it's done spinning and drying and washing, my bed sheets are still completely wet and they're dripping, and when I put them on the clothes rack, it's annoying. Not cool. And the common thread here is that these are two, are two very typical examples of what happens when AI malfunctions in our day-to-day -day life. And it's not Terminator attacking me. Fortunately, my washing machine is very well behaved and it doesn't, it doesn't usually punch me. But it's still annoying. And so I would like to ask this question again, now that we have more of an understanding of where we have AI. Who felt excited about artificial intelligence now? Can you please raise your arm? That's still quite a few people as far as I can see. That's cool. 
and who feels more worried about AI now? Can you also please raise your arm? I think that's fewer people than before, that's awesome. <laughs> but given that, how do we actually create the AI, the AI we actually want? So not the malfunctioning washing machines, but how do we get to the AI that we can actually use and that helps us in our day-to-day -day lives and that doesn't punch us in the face sometimes? If there's one thing I would like you to remember from this talk is this idea of that all of us, inclu including as we sit here, as we stand here, but everybody, people everywhere around, we all shape our technological future and in particular also the AI of our future. That might sound a bit controversial or surprising, but there's a pretty well-established idea in sociology. It comes from an American sociologist called Samuel Coleman. And his idea or his insight was that social change, including technological change, does not happen all just on the macro level. So it's not just the great political leaders and the technological leaders. So it's not just Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Larry Page and Sergey Brin and whoever else who's driving our technological future, but it's really all of us. But the individual actions we take that shapes how we see what kind of technology we will have in the future. So Elon Musk might want us to all drive self-driving cars, but unless we build the infrastructure for it that makes that possible together, and unless we actually buy all these cars, those cars will never leave the factory. And that's what Coleman meant by this. It's really all of us that shape how, we, how technology evolves. So you might be wondering now, where do we actually have influence on AI? It might say, it's all very nice to say that, but what does it actually mean to influence AI for us, or where can we do that? And there's this idea that I stole from my, from my master thesis, actually, which I wrote in Potsdam. And the idea is the ideas of social technical system that sounds super abstract, and of course it is. But the, the idea behind this is really that any activity that we do as society, as people, we usually do it either together with machines and as people together. So the two of them are interacting to carry out an activity. For instance, when I wash my laundry, I open up the washing machine, I put the, the laundry in, I select the program, and then my washing machine it spins and, and soaks and dries and everything. And in the end, I take it out again and put it on the clothes rack, hopefully dry. And there's a lot of things, if we look at everything as a social technical system, which consists of both machines and people, and we, especially when we talk about, about AI, we often tend to forget the people side of it, which I think is a bit unfortunate. We have a lot of leverage points how we can influence the machines and the people. So the machines, we can configure them, we turn them off, we can turn them on, we can reprogram them, we can reassemble them, and then we can even throw them off the window if we're really frustrated. But the people side, there's also a lot of things we can do. We can convince people. We can write them, we can seduce them, we can command them, we can petition them, and sometimes we can kick them if we're out again if we're really frustrated. Maybe it's not a good idea, but we can. And so, when, I, when we going back to my washing machine, the malfunctioning, I have a lot of options what I can do with my malfunctioning washing machine. I can change the programming. I can take it apart, I can turn it off. I can look inside it and see if I can change the wiring. And I can reassemble it again and hope it works better. Or on the other hand, if I look at, if we look at the people involved with the washing machine, I can change how I relate to my washing machine. Maybe I'm over-selecting the wrong program. It's entirely possible. And I can also call the technical hotline and figure out if they have advice for me. I can call in an electrician and see if they, he can fix my washing machine or they can fix my washing machine. And there's all sorts of things. Maybe even I have friends who have the same washing machine and they can help me fix my washing machine. In any case, there's all these things that I can, I have a lot of options what I can do with my washing machine, and it's not just looking at the AI and feeling frustrated about it. So, looking, zooming out a little bit, you may be wondering, we know we can interact with AI, but which roles do we actually play in relation to artificial intelligence? And I believe there's four fundamental roles that we play in relation to AI. One is we are, can be the users of an artificial intelligence system, which is me with my phone, it's me with my washing machine, and there I can pick which phone I buy, I can pick which washing machine I use. I have a choice. It's, it's kind of a limited choice, but I still have a choice whether I want something with an AI or not, and what, whatever else I do with it. 
And zooming out a little bit, if we actually if we become the customers of uh, the companies that build AI, we have even more leverage. We can start to negotiate with the companies about the features we want, what we're willing to pay for them, when we want it, and all these kind of things. And the difference between users and customers is sometimes subtle, but it's most obvious when we talk about social media system. So um, social media has a lot of sm small AI components. It's a news feed curation. It decides what we see. They decide what kind of people we're suggested to follow or interact with. They also su su suggest which kind of ads we see on our social media platform. But we are not the customers of the social media platforms because we don't pay for them. It's really the, the, pe the companies that buy the ads that are the customers. And so they have more leverage over the AI we use than we do. But when we do, when we are the customers, we have more opportunities. And going step, one step further beyond that, if we figure out how to, if we become developers of artificial intelligence system, as I have been for a while, we have even more influence. And it's something that we sometimes like to forget because we get all enamored with the technical details of what we build, but there's a high, highly important ethical responsibility that we have as AI developers. That even though we have deadlines pressures, we have pressures from our management, we have pressures from our clients, from the customers, we still have a make the final choice about what we build and, and it's something that is personally really important to me. And finally, and that's a perspective we like to forget sometimes, we also relate to AI as society. That's the most obvious example, or the most uh, best illustration of this is the example of facial recognition in surveillance cameras. We're not the cu customers of it, because we don't buy the facial recognition cameras in most cases. We're also not the users of it, because it might be the police department that's monitoring the feeds. But still, once we walk through the, if we walk through the, through the train station that has a surveillance camera installed, we're still part of, affected by it. And as such, there's quite a few of these kind of ambient AI systems that affect us over all the society, even though we're neither the users nor the customers of it. And as such, I believe there's a space for us to regulate artificial intelligence. And this is sometimes controversial, I'm not sure why, because we regulate all sorts of things from food to, to children's toys, to cars, to medicine. And I believe uh, AI should be fall, mostly falls into these categories and is worth considering whether we want it to be regulated and how we want it to regulate. So that's something, so we have all these four rules that we can play to figure out how we relate to artificial intelligence and how we can influence it. Now let's look at this a bit more concretely. How does that, did that play out with the, with the two stories that I told you in the beginning of my talk? My phone, in my phone system, because I paid for my phone, I'm actually the customer of the, of the, phone, com of the phone manufacturer, and so is everyone else who who bought the phones. And there was, a, I remember when I, back 18 months ago, there was a lot of outrage on social media about how our phones would no longer work with masks on. And the phone manufacturer actually listened and they released an update. And now it's possible to unlock the phone in other ways, which is very convenient. So even though now when I'm on the subway and I want to get a schedule, I can actually unlock my phone quickly. My washing machine, it didn't quite work that well. Even though I'm also the customer there, it's really hard to release an update for a washing machine because there's no way to install it, I guess. So I had to find other ways. I did call the manufacturer, they couldn't help me. I didn't want to pay an elect electrician to figure out whether they can reprogram the machine. But what I found is I can actually turn off the artificial intelligence. And I think that's sometimes a very legit option to just turn off the whole thing and go back to manual situation, to manual control whenever the AI is not really helpful. And so what I do is I just, pre 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 pro I just program how fast I want my washing machine to spin my bed sheets and then they're dry and I'm happy. So how do we actually use that to create the artificial intelligence we want? There's a lot of ideas in this talk, but what do we do with them? And I believe the most powerful thing we can do is to learn together as society. And that to me has two components to f how we can figure out how we create the AI we actually want. One is we need spaces to experiment with artificial intelligence. So these spaces, they need to be safe enough that we can fail. So for instance, like my washing machine, it's fairly safe. I mean, it's annoying that my bed sheets are wet, but I can override it, I can turn it off, and I can still dry my bed sheets properly. And similar to that, I believe we need more spaces where we can actually just try out, do we want this artificial intelligence? How, how do we want it? Does it work for us? What do we do with it? How can we alter it so that it's maybe more useful? 
And on the other hand, once we have figured that out in all these small little safe spaces, we need to come together to share what we learn. As a tech community, we do this really well, actually, because I, in the space of AI and machine learning grows so rapidly fast that nobody can keep up with it. And it's not even, not even the people that work in the field keep up with it. But what we do is we specialize. Each of us works in a very specific niche of artificial intelligence, and then we come together. We come together in meetups, in conferences, sometimes even for coffee, and we just talk about what we learned. And I would love to see that happen more in broader society. I would love to see us more take these opportunities to see what we figured out about our washing machines, about our cell phones, about the annoying chatbots, all these kind of things. How do we use them better, and how do we create them in a way that we, they actually do what we want? So, as I wind up this talk, I would like to leave you with two questions to reflect on and ponder about it maybe a little bit. The first of all is, where is AI in your daily life? Where does it surround you? Where does it annoy you? Where does it help you? And how do you want it to be? Thank you very much. <laughs>